doing a talk in front of Peter Jenner. Oh boy, <laughs> complete legend. No, uh, I, I'm. I don't like PCs, but we're gonna give this a go. Hey, all right. Oh, 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 oh I don't want to do that. Sorry. All right. I will allow. Okay, can everyone see? Oh, you really can't. Well, it, it'll it'll do fancy things. All right, you'll see. Prezi's amazing graphics and all that. Okay, I'd rather walk around. Can I? Okay, that's much better. I don't like being stuck here. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, okay, glad everyone can understand me. In some places I talk, they can't. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. It's my first time in Latvia, and uh, it's a really beautiful place. I can imagine what it's like when it's not freezing. Probably a lot nicer. Uh, my name is Shane Shapiro. Probably worth telling you why uh, Agnes has, uh, has lent me the mic for the next little while. And before I say that, just uh, a round of applause for Agnes and Guna. What they're doing is amazing. You really, you're very lucky to have them. Really, it's, uh, I know what they're going through, I promise. So yeah, so I run a company called Sound Diplomacy. I created the company in February of this year, so we're quite new. Um, we have offices in London, Barcelona, and Berlin, and a team of eight people. Uh, what we do mainly is based around two things. We organize music festivals and conferences, and we have 12 or 13 festivals in six or seven countries on four continents that we work on. And we also advise governments, trade associations, music business organizations on exports. Um, and we do that for quite a few, I think another six or seven governments. Uh, I am a week away from submitting my PhD on music exports and music funding and quotas and all sorts of stuff. And before this, I created and ran the Canadian music exports I wasn't the only person, but I sort of developed it, uh, and I ran it for three and a half years. And we still run it as a client to Sound Diplomacy. We also run the music export for Germany and for Colombia. I forget that sometimes. Um, and before that, I worked at a record label, an independent record label called One Little Indian, which at the time owned another label called Fat Cat. And I worked with uh, Bjork, uh, Sigurdsson, Paul McCartney, um, and a few other acts that you probably haven't heard of. I work for those three. I am originally from Canada. I moved over to the UK in 2004 with 160 pounds, knowing that my rent was 42 pounds and I had a month. And then I got a job and now I'm here. So I'm talking to you about export. And um, Agnes has asked me first off to, to go back to the basics, right? To start at the basics and then we'll work our way up. What is music export? That's the first question, I guess. And there's no one answer to that. Um, you know, simply music export is someone who does not know your music hearing your music. So you could be exporting your music to another part of Latvia if someone hasn't heard your music um, or to other countries or even to different parts of Riga. I know different scenes and so on and so forth. But we have created, a f well, we've developed a few rules, and most of those rules are based out of us making mistakes. So I've made virtually uh, most mistakes in this world that I can think of, and we've learned what not to do. And when you learn what not to do, it guides you then to learn what to do. So let's see if this works. Oh, oh, let's try again. All right, now we're starting. Now everyone can see. Oh, cool, huh? All right. That's Prezi. It's much cooler than PowerPoint. Um, this is apparently the exact same slide that was in Latvian in, in Agnes's presentation. <laughs> Some, okay. What is a music export office? There are different types of music export offices. The main one is a government organization in one way or another, either tied to the Ministry of Culture or the Ministry of Economics or sometimes Foreign Affairs. And obviously some governments do not have these ministries or call them something different. In Canada, we we're called the Ministry of Heritage, which is an interesting one. Um, and some of them are private matters run through music industry associations. Uh, it's quite a new thing. So the first one was in France in 1993, and France has a long history of supporting its cultural industries. Uh, France was the world's first ministry of culture, uh, also set up the world's first collection society. So they're kind of first with, with all those things. And uh, that was only in 1993, and 10 years ago, there were only five or six. 
really. So when I started, I was working for this label, and we had a Canadian band that just wasn't getting anywhere. They, they were not doing very well. I won't name them who they are. And I had met someone uh, who ran the Norwegian office through another band called Silly Ness that we had signed to a label called Fat Cat. So when I met this person who was working for Norway, I discovered that Canada at the time didn't have a music export office. And in some instances now, it still doesn't. Like, we provide services that are similar to that, but we don't have a government department that says we are a music export office. We do it a little bit differently. So I thought, well, why not give it a go? Why Canada should have one. So I wrote a really terrible business plan, and I submitted it to the government, and they laughed at me. So then I wrote another one, and then I wrote another one, and eventually the Independent Label Association in Canada gave me a chance. And... That year, we did three events uh, in Europe, and at the height, we did 30-odd events in 25 countries uh, a few years ago. So now we're down to 15 to 20 events. So this is a new phenomenon. And the first and most important thing is, to have a music export office, you need to have something to export. Just because you play in a band doesn't mean anyone should care about you. Again, just because you play in a band doesn't mean I should care. I genuinely don't give a shit that you play in a band. You know, if you are a nurse or a firefighter or a doctor, I think that's a more valuable job. Being a professional musician is a privilege, it's not a right. And you have to earn that privilege through business development. That is really important. And a music export office fulfills part of that role, okay? The whole point to me of a music export office is equally about development of the business within a country as it is exporting the content outside of a country. So again, if you don't have something to export, then if you put yourself in front of an audience in the UK or in London, and that content isn't suitable, then you will lose your first impression. You'll lose that chance. And, and you know, I'm, I'm impatient. I live in London. I'm one of those UK kind of music industry people. And you usually only have one chance to make a first impression nowadays. Everything is so fast, there's so much music out there, and you have to take that very seriously. And we see music export offices, they're the ones who can structure those first impressions in the best possible way. They're the ones who have the contacts, the network, the expertise, the understanding to say, hey, this is where you should be going. But the music that you make has to be at a certain business level, we'll say. Not only a certain business level, it has to obviously be good. Because it's this weird thing. If, if you suck, nothing works, right? You have to be good. And, uh, and I can't tell you what's good and bad because that is different. I think you have to write music that's true to yourself. Don't try to copy what a band in London is doing, for example. So that kind of is the belief that we try to build our music export model. And Canada... Uh, has had a reasonably good track record for the last 10 years. We've had a few bands that have been successful. We also have some terrible bands, like Nickelback. Does anyone in this room like Nickelback? No? Someone has to. They sold out the O2 Arena in London, so that's 18,000 people. I've yet to never meet a Nickelback fan. I know the band personally. They're very nice, but I've never met a fan. Who are these people? <laughs> Do they just show up at the, at the gig? <laughs> Moving on. So... A lot, of countries, a lot of countries set up export offices before they're ready to set up export offices. And I think that Latvia is at a perfect time because we're discovering some fantastic music from here. Uh, I know of a few bands, and Guna has been instrumental in this because she's the first Latvian I had met in the industry. And I believe that the development of the bands here is good, but the development of the business is just beginning. And a music export office, and what, what is happening here is that first step to say, okay, fine, let's set up the infrastructure. Let's understand what it takes to be a professional musician or to be a professional music business person, whether you are setting up a label, whether you're a publisher, whether you're managing bands, whether you work in sync and licensing. Um, there's so many different jobs. And... I want to stress that the music industry nowadays is amazing, okay? I'm a positive person. I think now is the best time to be in this business. Um, people who know how to make money are making lots of money. 
and there are so many ways that you can uh, bring revenue through your intellectual property, i.e. your music. Um, it's not so much about selling records over the counter or selling CDs. They obviously, you know, everywhere in the world, no one's really buying those anymore unless you spend a lot of money <laughs> at a major label level. But the usage of music, music in the world, music as um, in film, television, advertising, games, all that type of stuff is going up. It means that there's more music to fulfill less opportunities, but there's more music. So people are making less money uh, in film and sync and, and all that stuff now, but more people are making money. There's more money to go around. And it's a really, really positive thing. And going back to the export office, its role is to help understand these pathways. Because this is a complicated business. Um, the diversification of revenue, how we make money, is really complicated. We're not just selling something. We're not, we're not a tire manufacturer, and we make tires, and then we sell them, and they put them on cars. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but it's relatively simple. You make, you make a product, a product is consumed. Music, you make your product, and it's consumed in a multitude of ways. And you have to understand those pathways, because if you understand them, then you can make money off of them. And one of the educators is the Music Export Office. So we have, we have been advising other governments, so to speak, and organizations. Um, Austria just set up an export office a couple years ago, and they're actually really good. Um, there's a couple Austrian bands, mainly electronic artists, that are doing reasonably well. Uh, we work with the government of Uganda, of all places. See, Uganda's not exporting to you or to Europeans. They're exporting to Kenyans, but they're still exporting. Uh, Uruguay is setting one up, so on and so forth. So there's lots and lots of governments. So Latvia is not alone in this. Latvia is part of an amazing transformation where lots of countries are finding their voice. It's just how you develop and structure that voice is really, really important, or no one will listen to you. And you'll learn this with me. I'm really honest. I sometimes say things in a brutal or way, and it sounds rude. I'm not rude. I promise. I'm just. I just don't care. Like to upset someone, um, you have to be polite, but you also have to be realistic. And uh, and sometimes they they aren't the same thing. Dun da da da. That was good. See, now it's a box. <laughs> All right. Um, I believe that. This is, these are the four pillars of an export office. Uh, it's, there's way more than this. Um, an export office is as transformative as, as, any, as, as, as baking bread, right? There's, see, there's uh, hundreds of types of bread, and there's hundreds of types of things an export office can do, really. Um, it can, all it can do is just compile databases, for example. There are some export offices and some governments that they just compile databases of contacts. But I do believe that a contact is o an email address is only an email address without a relationship. It's about the relationship. It's not about the email address behind it. So these are the four factors. I put music industry development as number one because it is the most important. Music splits across cultural and economic reasons. And there's one... There's one thing that we've noticed, um, we or I and my business partners have noticed in some countries is that uh, pop music or commercial music or whatever you call it is often seen as market, as something for the market where classical music, former high art music, um, opera, so on, is seen as a cultural thing. So the Ministry of Culture funds classical music and then pop music is just a market-driven thing. Sometimes it gets a little bit of money through economic development. I think that those uh, splits are ridiculous. Uh, first off, culture is a, is a basic human right, and popular music is culture. And I feel that music industry development crosses all genres. Classical music is an industry. Popular music is an industry. And a music export office should be communicating with and fulfilling the objectives of both cultural and economic um, requirements. Because a country expresses its culture by expressing itself. And 
it's usually popular music is called popular for a reason. So I do believe that those definitions are dying very, very slowly. There are still countries where I have to go in and like, oh, no, no, you know, it doesn't mean I don't want classical music to be funded. <laughs> Please, still fund it. I just also want this to be supported, too, for these reasons. And they're different reasons, and it's not one against the other. And that comprises music industry development. You have to be able to tell the story. And often you're telling the story to people who don't understand, which is government. And it's not government's job to understand the music industry. It's our job to, under, to make them understand. And that is one of the factors of a music export office. In addition, it's the Music Export Office's role, in some ways, to set benchmarks for its members. All of you in this room, I should have asked, how many of you are musicians? Okay, most of you. Anyone, managers, labels, business people? I see. Okay, I see a very big hand at the top there. Okay, so quite a few, sort of 60-40. All of you are the constituents. You know, that word constituents or st even stakeholders of a music export office. A music export office only works if you want it to work. Because if you guys aren't participating in the activities that Ag Agnes and, and Guna and whoever are, are uh, providing, then they're going to fail over time. Because you'll realize this, if you only have a couple bands to export, they eventually go through the circuit and play all the festivals and then you're stuck. <laughs> and then what, are they going to do it again? So you have to always have a steady stream of new music. And also it creates a reputation. It creates a greater relationship with who you're trying to sell your music to. So for, y for you guys to get the most out of the office, you have to work together with the objectives of the office to understand what these what the office needs from you. And it's not just great music, it's, it's business. It's business acumen, it's business skills. And they're not doing this to drive you crazy. They're doing this because the global market is demanding it. And it is hugely competitive out there. Trust me, I live in East London, you know, where hipsters just come out of the ether. And, you know, and there's a new cafe every literally every two days on my high road. And there's so many bands. In London, and I hope Peter doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, um, call this a mistake, but I believe there's over 200 gigs a night in London, greater London, between 150 and 200 gigs a night. Think about this. If there's 200 gigs a night and you're coming and playing London at your first show, you will directly compete with between five of those gigs at the lowest level, and you will indirectly compete with maybe 20, just because of the music you play has to be similar enough to five of those 200 gigs. Basic math. If you're not better, if you don't have a better business case, if, you, if your marketing, if your uh, online content and your persona isn't more interesting than those other gigs, no one will care about you. And London is very cutthroat. No one cares. You have to make them care. And I tell Canadian, band, Canadian bands this all the time. They come over. We have Canadian bands because we have a lot of funding in Canada. So bands come over when they're not ready a lot. And I yell at them. And I'm like, and then they come and they play like one venue to 30 people and then they complain. And I'm like, well, it's your fault. You just threw all this money away because you weren't ready. And the thing is, these benchmarks have to be agreed upon by everybody. If you understand what an export office requires of you, because the global market requires it of the export office, then slowly, you, you know, it, the mindset begins to change to think, oh, you know, maybe I should really think about how I'm perceived, how I look online. What sites am I using to promote myself? How do I, literally, how does my record sleeve, my pack shot, how does it um, look alongside my stage show, my, um, my online sites. You know, there's very, very few bands that I've met that ever practice on a stage. No one ever does that. But performing on a stage is different to performing in a rehearsal space. And there's so many bands that come on stage wearing the same shit that they wore that day, playing their music and then leaving. And that bothers the hell out of me. And there's so many bands. And sorry if I'm swearing, by the way. I, I sometimes swear. And... Um, that bothers me because 
there's, there's this concept of a show that is being lost here. And you have to think about when you step on stage, everything that you are, every touch point that someone can view your content in one way or another, you have to try to think about how you can influence them. And if you come to London and you come and you play your songs and no one cares, then you've lost your first chance. And then it becomes more difficult. So music industry development, I go off on tangents sometimes, I'm sorry. Music industry development is hugely important. And it's not just about the music. No one can tell you how you should make the music that you plan on making other than just make the music that's individual to you. Don't look at the Arctic Monkeys and sound like them, okay? We have one of them already. We need bands that sound like you as individuals. That's what we want to hear. And, but you also have to think about how you market yourself. And that's where I come in. That's what I do. So it, it really is part of the export office to encourage and develop and strengthen music industry development. Cultural value is hugely important. Governments love this. Uh, and they should because tourism brings money to economies. Riga is a ridiculously beautiful place and people should come here frequently. It's cheap, uh, people are really nice, you all speak English, this is all positives. And a country can tell a lot about itself through its music. It's, this is very, very important. And a music export office has a role in that. I think that role can only be fulfilled through strong music industry development. I think everything relates to everything else. But what does Latvian music mean? To me, like Canadian music or British music or whoever, it probably means nothing because there's so many different types of music. But you do want to try, you do want to try to craft that conversation. And that's the job of the export office when it goes to, <coughs> sorry, when it goes to the Reeperbahn Festival in Germany, the Great Escape, um, Eurosonic, all these events. Uh, and it tells a story through the music that it's presenting. And it all has to promote something intangible, Latvia, right? And there's a, you know, and, and country, you know, the, 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 the country as a whole was only invented really 250 years ago, right? The nation, the concept of a nation. And then what you perceive as yourself through what am I being Latvian, it doesn't really... There's no hard and fast rules, as what am I as a Canadian is different to the next Canadian. But you still have to try to develop, and that's, that's what an export office does. It, cre it creates pathways to understanding Latvia. And that comes to better internationalization. I spelled it right? Yeah, all right. Better internationalization of Latvian music. I have heard of half a dozen maybe Latvian bands. Uh, at Reeperbahn, I saw a great singer-songwriter. I don't remember who she was, but... Um, there was a, a great Latvian singer-songwriter. There we go. And, um, and, uh, and there was Black Balsam. There's, you know, that's... And, uh, and, but that's the thing. The more, the, the more you try, the more you work with other countries, the more you're active in the international market, the easier opportunities become. Okay? Let's see what the next slide holds. Oh, all right. Um... Latvia, two million people, I, you said, right? That's like nothing. It's amazing. There's very few of you. But again, look at Iceland. There's 300,000 of them. And they've produced Bjork, Sigurás of Monsters and Men, and so on and so forth. And Iceland's a country I know a lot about because I've been there many times because I had to work there. Um, and there's a lot that can be learned from them and from other Nordic countries, but that's the thing. I think that you have to have touch points in music export, and I think uh, Positivist Festival is a really, really good one. It's a great festival. It's run by good people, and it's well run, and it's international, and all of that. And, and, um, but as I see it, there is very little music industry development here. There, um, there really isn't much major label uh, involvement in Latvia, as I've been told. Uh, I don't really know any Latvian management companies or labels that are, um, that are big enough to be known to us in London. I'm sure there are, but I just don't know. Um, it's not part of the world-class touring market yet. What I mean by that is it's 
people don't say, oh, I have to play in Riga. <laughs> Not yet, you know, or I have to route myself through Riga to get to Helsinki. Or it is starting to happen. And again, the role of an export office is to make this stuff work better. More international bands play in Riga. That's more support slots for Latvian bands. That's in everyone's best interest. And also, more successful Latvian bands potentially means more opportunities for international acts to collaborate with them. And it's not just touring, it's top lining. I'm sure there's some fantastic Latvian singer songwriters. Does everyone know what top lining is? No? You be honest, it's fine. Top lining is singing on top of a dance track, right? When there's record producers, mainly EDM, but it happens in other forms of electronic music, and they need a vocalist, there are, there's a whole industry out there that simply finds vocalists for these tracks. And this is a way that you can make a lot of money. And, and there are pathways to this, mainly through Amsterdam dance events and the Winter Conference in Miami and other things. Just these are little things that people don't think about. Again, you're in a band, you play guitar, you know, you, you wear plaid, and uh, like every Canadian, and you think, oh, I got to go on tour and make a record. And, and it's not that simple. You know, there's people who make wages, monthly wages, through YouTube. There's, um, there's people who produce material or who do exchanges with material. And you can use your content in a number of ways. One of the best things that I learned was that when you have a record, every record should have at least 100 assets attached to it. Now, what do I mean by that? What is an asset? An asset is anything that isn't the song that is used to promote the album. The cover art, pictures, your website, um, really anything attached to the album. And the one thing that people sometimes don't do is they forget to master the instrumentals or the stems of a record. A stem is a part of a song. And often you have publishers coming around interested in a band and they said, oh, send me your instrumentals. And you haven't mastered them. And then you have to pay more money to get them mastered. And you have to think about how many avenues you have to work with your music. You know, it's just recording a song, that doesn't impress me. Making sure that you have a extensive array of promotional material. And that's not just forward-facing promotional material. That's material to potential clients, to potential coworkers, to potential business people. And the best managers are the ones that understand this and will create the content and then make sure that it is easily available. And one of the, I said this in a, I had to do a talk in Poland yesterday. I said this um, in Warsaw and one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, which was from a former boss of mine, is learn how not to waste other people's time. If you can do that, then things start to happen quicker. And what I mean by that is, and this is, comes back to the business development and the concept of export offices, is you should have all that stuff readily available. It should be uploaded onto a server somewhere so that if someone needs something, you don't have to rush to do it. It's all there and then it saves you time. And these are the kind of tricks that I learned running the Canadian office because people asked us for stuff that we didn't have. And when people ask you for something that you don't have or you have to create, it wastes your time because you have to make it, right? You have other things to do. So we wrote everything down. <laughs> Every time someone asked us for something that we didn't have, we kept a list. And then at the end of the year once, Myself and my, um, my, my employee, Ro, we actually went back and we built a little back-end system where we uploaded everything onto a Google Drive that we could think of. And any time we work with a band, we make them do the exact same system. So we set up a folder for the band, we make them upload everything into this back-end so that it's all there. And then we have a text file with all the links attached to it. So if someone wants something, it's all there. And then we have someone who monitors it every month, and so on and so forth. These are the types of things that I learned running an export office, especially when you're traveling so much. You don't speak any language except English. So there's, uh, you know, we have posters in other languages, all sorts of things that you have to think about. So getting off topic, sorry. So why music export? Kind of 
saying the same thing. Uh, no. <laughs> Why music export for me is because this is the time to do it. Latvia is at a cusp of becoming, you know, a, a global player in the international music market. And that's not just selling to Britain, the USA, and those markets. That's also looking eastwards. That's also selling within the Baltic region and the Nordic countries and Eastern Europe. And I believe that uh, the development of the country, um, it's the fact that you guys have kind of come out of the, the financial crisis now a little bit, and other countries are much more mired in it. Trust me, I have an office in Barcelona. I understand. And um, I believe that now is the time, and I believe there's a lot of young creative people here. So if you don't set it up properly, then it will fail because everything that works properly takes a long time to set up in the beginning. Everything. And that's the sort of Malcolm Gladwell rule. Everyone know what I'm talking about? The author, the American author Malcolm Gladwell said that you need 10,000 hours of work for something to be successful. 10,000 hours equates to about 10 years. If you work on something for 10 years, then usually it works. Um, or so he says. And I kind of agree with that in principle. I, you know, everything that, everything that becomes quote unquote successful, <clears throat> and I don't mean just financially successful, I mean conceptually, politically, culturally, um, emotionally successful, it takes a long time. And the music export office is your hub, is your incubator, is, is the rock that you need that you can attach everything to to start to understand the pathways on how to get off of the rock. As I, you know, who was in that movie, The Rock? Um, Nicolas Cage, get off of, uh, you know, no one, has anyone seen that movie? A few of you, thank you. It was a bad movie, Con Air was better. And um, so that's, that's what I mean. And, and if you don't do that, then all you're doing is wasting resources. And your time is a resource. It's a non-renewable resource. And everyone should be paid for their time. I believe that a, that a musician is a job. No one, not everyone's entitled to it, but for those that are, a musician is a job who should be paid eight hours a day, like any other job. And there is, but there's only a finite amount of time. And if you spend a lot of it putting pieces together instead of building from a core, then you'll realize very quickly that things aren't working. And I speak from experience. I set up a company by myself in February of this year. I, trust me, I didn't think that we would have two other offices. We'd have to get things translated into four languages, and we'd have staff and all sorts. And every mistake that I made in February has come back to haunt me. Every mistake. We've had to redo our entire business structure to facilitate the growth, which is not a bad thing. I'm very lucky, but still, I made so many mistakes that I wish I didn't make. And now I know what I should have done. And it's always good in hindsight. So try to get into the mindset of, well, what, what do they need from me? What is the international music buyer, that booking agent in London, Reaper Bond Festival, whoever? What, what are they looking for? And then work your way back. And by having a robust music export office, you'll, you'll, have, the, um, you'll have the tools to do so. I need some water. Does everyone understand this far? Is it okay? Is it okay? You know? Yeah. All right. I'm trying not to waste your time, right? That's important. And I thought about this in that, in that sense. Artists must be export ready. What is export ready? Tough one. It's a pretty stupid term, first off. Um, it's, um, and it, it is new. I think it's a relatively new term. It, it, it came about through the development of export offices. But we always think about this. The first thing is, if you are export ready, someone else should tell you that. If you think you're export ready, you're not. <laughs> okay? I promise. Um, if, you know, if you haven't built up at least some semblance of business success in your home market, I believe then you're not export ready. 
i.e. is the first time you tour, you'll lose money. I promise. The second time you tour, you'll probably lose money. The third time, you'll break even. And then the fourth time, you'll hopefully make money. If you don't have a place to go and make some of that money back, then it's going to produce difficulties. And, um, and we always say that it's always good to have some sort of success at home so that you can come home, play a show, and make some of the money back. Or you have a product in market. Export ready also means you have to have people working with you. If you're self-managed most of the time, I don't believe that you're export ready. Um, that is not a hard and fast rule. There are self-managed people that are. But when you're really busy, it gets very, very difficult to handle your day-to-day -day business when you're playing shows. Uh, a perfect example is I worked, I, I worked with an artist named Dan Mangan, Canadian guy, who Peter knows. And um, I had worked with him for years, and he was self-managed. And things, start to, things started to pick up a little bit. Uh, he got signed to Arts and Crafts in Canada and got signed to City Slang Records in Germany. He got a big booking agent. Things were starting to happen, and he was coming over and doing a two-and-a-half-week tour of Europe. Um, and I was planning it with him, and he was touring Canada at the time. And then he got swine flu. <laughs> and he was confined to his bed for a week and a half in a hotel room in eastern Canada. And, it, and because he was the person who had to make all the decisions. He was the person who was coordinating things with me. Everything stopped. And the tour got fucked up, and some shows didn't get their posters, and certain things didn't happen because some things on his side weren't ready. We had to rush a visa for him, and so on and so forth. And if he had a manager, then all of that would have, uh, wouldn't have happened. And you get to a certain level, and he was selling... 150 to 200 tickets in major European markets. Now he sells, now he sold 900 tickets his last London show. And um, he realized when he got better, and this was when Canada had swine flu, uh, he realizes when he got better, he's like, oh, I need a manager. And then the next day he hired a manager. <laughs> and you, you only need a manager when you realize you need a manager. And that is that moment where I believe that it's time to really seriously think about exporting. Lots of festivals uh, are promoted to you like a golden egg. South by Southwest. It's a massively expensive pain in the ass for the most part. Uh, it's fun, but for those who've been there, it's pretty difficult to get noticed. Um, you have to be prepared to capitalize on the opportunity if one is presented to you. An opportunity means nothing unless you can capitalize on it. That is really, really important. Just because you get a festival offer, it doesn't mean you should play it. Really, just because you get a gig, to me, it doesn't mean that you should play it because you could, if you feel that you could be better prepared from a marketing standpoint, that you could sell more tickets, that you could be of more value to the festival, so on and so forth, wait. Waiting is, there's nothing wrong with waiting. And I believe that export-ready artists understand this. If you just jump on every opportunity, you're not export-ready, okay? If you, if you give Guna, uh, Guna or Agnes a CD and say, book me a tour, you're not export-ready. <laughs> That's not their job. It's your job to convince them to work with you. It's not their job in that sense. And I do believe that because those bands that, that get the press, those bands that get blog love, those bands that are active on YouTube, that are getting lots of hits, and so on and so forth, those are the bands that people will come to you. And continually asking means that you're spending so much time asking, and you're not spending enough time creating content. And content is king. So those are little sort of rules about, to me, what makes a band export ready. And in Canada, we have a lot of folk singers, <laughs> a lot of earnest folk singers that sing about the rain and how much they, you know, love wheat. And, uh, and then they come over and they play cafes and they play coffee shops, they do house concerts, and that's all well and good. But I'm not in the business of house concerts and coffee shops. I'm in the business of 
you know, big soft seater theaters, big, big spots on advertising campaigns and so on. So there are people who come over, play the same venues every time, and they're happy with it. And that's okay. I have nothing against that. But you have to realize where do you want to go? What, what do you see yourself achieving? And there are some Canadian singer-songwriters that are happy playing to 200 people every time because they're making a living. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the artist that I work with. But it doesn't mean that that's wrong. So the thing is, is export ready means understanding the markets that you want to uh, enter. And there are lots of touring opportunities that people tend not to care about. There's lots of DIY venues in Germany. You could book a tour yourself in Germany if you wanted. Maybe some of you already have. But there's only certain venues in Germany that people care about. And those are the ones that are hard to get into. So definitive infrastructure. I tend not to read from my presentations too much, because you guys can read, I'm sure. But uh, you know, definitive infrastructure means an understanding. It's also in your head as much as it is on the internet, on paper, in spreadsheets, and so on and so forth. Other things that you need to think about is your literal business infrastructure, business registration, taxes, all that type of stuff. Because trust me, if you don't have that stuff sorted, it will become a problem later. I promise. Um, there are some countries, because you're in the EU, it's a lot easier, but there are still some countries where there's certain tax liabilities and all sorts. And, and you have to see your band as a business. To me, a band is an SME, a small to medium enterprise. Every band slash singer slash artist, whatever you call it, is an SME. And the analogy that I use in terms of export ready <coughs> is opening up a restaurant. I'm really into food. Sorry. <laughs> I love food and I love everything about it. And um, when someone opens up a restaurant, they're going to buy food. They're going to hire a chef. They're going to get tables and plates and knives. You know, they're going to design it. And when all of that is ready, then they will open the doors, right? In a band, I believe that you should have the same mentality. You should think about all the things that you need to sort out before you open those doors, so to speak, to the international market. And you can figure all those stuff out in Latvia. You really can. Thankfully, the internet is a wonderful thing as well, and it can tell you. You can read what other people are writing about. You can learn while remaining in your home market developing because when you decide to take that first step, whether that's to the UK, whether that's to Germany, whether it's to Talon Music Week or Vilnius Music Week or some bands go to China and Japan, um, you have to be ready for those opportunities because if you come back broke, it's going to make it difficult to return to those markets. And once you decide to export into a market, you have to be committed to it, to return at least twice a year. And if you don't do that, then people will lose interest, especially in the UK where, we have, where we're all ADHD and we have no attention span. <laughs> so it's true. Why now? I kind of went over some of this. I kind of just go off on tangents and then go back to the presentation. It's just the way I am. But I genuinely believe that this is the best time to be in the music industry. I believe that everyone should really be excited about being a musician or a label owner or whatever it is you choose to do. But it's also the most complex. It requires a lot of skills. Um, it requires a reasonable amount of business acumen. Uh, one of the things that I never did that I wish I did was take an introductory to accounting class in university. I studied cultural studies. Super useful. Uh, actually have a PhD in it now. And, um, but I never took introduction to accounting. And now I have, now we, our company invoices in up to six currencies. It's really confusing. <laughs> and I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. And I've hired someone to help me, which costs me money. But if I just learned a little bit at the time, I probably would have been better placed to understand these requirements. And also just basic management of assets. Keep things simple. Keep things, I, be, I believe in the cloud. I like keeping things in a cloud, but also saving it to a hard drive. But keep things simple for yourself. Don't overcomplicate your life. You know, organize your emails. 
Very few people do that. Organize your contacts. I've had to reorganize 20,000 contacts. Again, cost me money. But I did, and now it's amazing. <laughs> it's very cool. But I didn't do that at the time, and I should have. And all these types of things, because it will allow you to focus your energy on the complex issues in the music industry, which is usually about how do I make money, how do I negotiate that contract, all that type of stuff. And another thing that you should all understand is rights. Everyone should have basic understanding of how rights work in the UK, uh, not the UK, how rights work in the music industry. I was lucky, I taught a music copyrights class in university. So I had to learn so I could teach it. And there's very few, there's a lot of musicians that just don't understand. And if you don't understand, chances are you may get screwed over and you don't want that. So basic stuff. And all of this is online. Google music rights beginner. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many free tutorials there are for you to understand mechanical and performance royalties and stuff like that. So the um, speech that the, uh, the wonderful person from the trade and industry, is he still here? No? Okay. He was wearing a suit. It's always nice when a person wearing a suit talks well about the music industry. <laughs> um, uh, always makes me happy. But that's the thing is the Music Export Office, their job is to keep the government happy because the government is one of the stakeholders. They're one of the investors. They should not be the only investor. The industry has to invest as well. But they are one of them. And I believe now it seems uh, in Latvia for the most part, I know that there's there's been some changes in the last week, um, but um, I feel that now is, seems to be a good time, and, and I believe that now Music Export Latvia is developing the power to create case studies to prove its worth, i.e. .e. the music industry, to the government here. And governments are finicky things, you know, they unfortunately can change in an instant, but by developing case studies, by developing a a canon of research, you, you always have something to go back to. And I believe that now is a good time to do that. So I think I've said everything on this one. So I, I have a few case studies. Oh, no, I've got one more before I have case studies. Um, and this is why I believe that Latvia needs to continue in its path of building up a successful, robust, and... Uh, and unique export office with a voice. And another quick sort of digression. I know we've been chatting a bit about quotas. Uh, Canada, other than France, was the first country to get a quota on radio. We have, we've had a quota since 1971. Um, and quotas are very finicky things. Uh, we found sometimes that the quota was usually just filled up by Nickelback and Brian Adams over and over and over again. And then came along Justin Bieber, and then we were screwed, because <laughs> he's Canadian too. And then Carly Rae Jepsen, so they had four artists over and over. You know the song Call Me Maybe? Canadian. All right. Yeah. One of um, the guy who owns the rights to that song is a client of mine. It's amazing how many houses he has built through that song. Uh, but... What we say, opportunity plus education plus research plus networking. That is what Export Office is. It creates opportunities. It has a database of festivals and it knows the festivals personally. Because again, it's just a festival unless you know who's booking it and you have a relationship with that person booking it. Um, education, if you guys don't understand what that festival is looking for and you don't work towards it, then that festival is not going to care. And research helps out both of those sides, and it's all led through networking. By building relationships with people, you, and, and this is genuinely, genuinely a business of relationships. I guess every business is. I don't know there is a business that isn't about relationships, but the music industry is, is small. It is. We're not biotech, we're not oil and gas and all of that. And at a certain level, I believe that everyone kind of knows everyone else a little bit and or you're one person away from the person that you need to know. And if you build up a reputation of respect, of transparency, 
and of kindness, then it enhances your network. And it's not just you personally, but it's also the export office that has to do this. You know, and it's similar to a corporation. A corporation you always think of in a personal way. What does Coke think? What does Shell think? Which is really weird because it's a corporation. But it's the same with an export office. And if, and I always say this, if you're a dick, you're not going to go very far. You have to be a really nice person because nice people, to me, are the best people to deal with in the music industry. And you have to understand how to network. There's a concept of being overbearing. There's a concept of emailing people too much. There's emailing people or calling people when you're not ready to, when you don't have something to offer them. There's asking for things too quickly. All of these things, they're all skills. You learn this stuff. You're not born with this stuff. <coughs> and it's the export office that creates these educational tools to help you understand. And you'd be surprised that if you email someone and you have something definitive to offer them, they'll email you back. And I get so many people who email me. First, they spell my name wrong. Lots of people spell my name wrong. I won an award last week in the UK. First one I've ever won. Spelled my name wrong on the award. <laughs> Engraved into the award, which was fantastic. My girlfriend found it very funny. And, um, but that's OK. Even, you know, my grandmother used to spell my name wrong, and, and people who know me personally spell my name wrong. But it's just little things like that. It's understanding. And, and when you're communicating with someone, you always have to think about what their objectives are. What do they want out of this situation? Think about them as much as you're thinking about yourself. You'd be surprised how the path, the relationship develops. And it is not about buying and selling all the time. It is about building up friendship and relationships because it's way easier to do business with someone you trust and you don't develop trust immediately by them pushing something on you. And sometimes there's managers that come to events <coughs> or labels or bands or whatever and they're just a bit too forward. And you have to learn these skills and these skills are taught internally by the music export office because they're the ones who have to learn it from everybody else. And all the export offices communicate. You don't realize that, but Agnes is on emails with 40 other, 50 other export offices all the time. We chat. We talk about festivals. We talk about how much we pay for things. We, we meet as much as we can. So this is a gateway to the world. You know, there's a private export office meeting at Eurosonic, for example, where we're going to talk about taking over the, I don't know, how much we hate festivals and, and, and the charges they, uh, and, the, and the cost of them. No, I'm joking. We're, we're trying to figure out ways that we can work together more. And we're trying to set up a way that the export offices can have an internal network that we can better communicate internally with each other. That completely opens up the world. And by having one person who is Latvia, she emails me and says, oh, I need to get a hold of this person in Canada. There you go, right? There's the connection. That's easy because I know everyone in Canada and you know everyone in Latvia, right? I'm not joking. <laughs> Canada is not a big country in terms of the music industry. It's just a big country if, to, if you have to drive through it. And, um, and that's the thing about an export office. It's your, it's your pathway. It's so easy if it's robust. It's so easy if the relationship is there. And I've made some of the best contacts that I've done amazing business with through the networks of export offices. The Norway guy, his name's Jonas, the Norway guy who I copied essentially has become one of my best friends. And him and I have done tons of work together. We co-chaired a, a research project together. And that's all come through us becoming friends and developing a relationship. Not, oh, here this Canadian band, they're amazing. I don't do that because that's not, that's not how it works. So and I said, if Latvian music's to be respected, Latvia needs to be respected in this context. And the perfect example is Brainstorm, right? They're a band that has done that, that a lot of us know because they have got out there. And I know they're very famous in Latvia, but they're not very famous in other places. And they've gone out there and they've respected the markets they're in. They've played small clubs because that is the context that is suitable for them in these markets. That's important. That shows respect because we have bands that play stadiums in their home market, and then they come and they demand something similar. And you can't demand that. You have to respect the context and the market that you're in. 
That's really important. And I really respect a band that can sell 40, 50,000 tickets in the market and then come there and be a showcasing artist because that shows a true dedication to the business of your craft. Because just because you conquer one place doesn't mean you've conquered every place. So, so I've said this in a way, what is needed? Everyone needs to align in a single vision, and I mean that. Everyone needs to trust the person who runs the export office, and I believe you guys are very lucky here. That person who runs the export office cannot manage anyone, cannot work directly with anyone, or own any copyrights, because that means that compromises the neutrality. And an export office is completely and 100% neutral. They do not promote anyone above anybody else. They promote business. If someone proves that they are a, bus a better business case, that is the band that is to be promoted. It's not because they're friends of mine. And there are some export offices that only promote friends of theirs. And that is a challenge. And again, you do that once and it creates a bit of a reputation. You do it twice, that's who you are. And again, we, we're all so busy that we kind of judge people very quickly. We don't mean to. You're all judging me now. I don't know you, but I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. And, um, and I have to, I'm trying to think about everything that I can say to you to help in this situation. And, and I think a lot off the top of my head. It's just the way my brain works. And um, that is one thing that I always say. And there's one country that we work with where they have two competing factors trying to run export offices. And by doing that, they're killing each other because no one cares because one festival has to deal with these people, another festival has to deal with these people. And then we're like, who, who are we dealing with here? And... It always is learning how not to waste other people's time, which translates to the path of least resistance to the buyer. If the pitch is simple, the response is usually simple. And that, I believe, is happening here. And that needs to continue across music industry, across collection societies, across governments, and most importantly, across you guys, because you guys are the end product. And, and the one thing I've learned is if the band isn't happy, everything fails. Right? If the band isn't happy, nothing else matters. And everything I say comes back to the success of the artist. Every single thing I say. And that is really, really important. And the people who work within this have to understand that. And I believe they do here. So that, and I, I think Latvia should have a World Cast Showcase Festival. What I mean by that is it could be within Talon Music Week. It could be within Vilnius Music Week. But Latvia needs a voice to showcase its best artists. And I think there's conversations that are happening right now that will probably lead to something like that. And I believe there's greater networking to be done across the Baltic states, which I believe is already happening. Uh, all of you guys should go to Talon Music Week if you've never been. Helen runs a really, really good festival. And there's a lot of really good people there. And the Brits are starting to notice. And a lot of Brits are starting to go to Talon Music Week. So there is an opportunity to meet new people. I got there, finally, all right. So I use Scandinavia as an amazing case study because I'm, I think that they're, uh, I think they get a lot of things right in the Nordic countries. We did a party in Toronto, uh, in Toronto, yeah, at Canadian Music Week, and it was myself and the Norwegians, and we called it Candinavia. Liked it? No? All right, moving on. Uh, and, uh, but the Nordic countries have a collective export office called Nordic Music Export, but it doesn't showcase anything. It just does research and strategy, which I think is very clever, and some other programs. And then they each have individual music export offices. And they have good relationships for the most part. It's not that simple, but good relationships between the Music Information Center and the Music Export Office, and they are different. Music Information Centers are usually classical music or folk music, but that music still needs to be exported through business development. So there's partnerships. Finland is a really good example of that. Uh, music and media is their main event. Um, and Sweden punches well above its weight. I'm sure everybody knows. <coughs> there's been a lot of pop hits written by Swedes in the last little while. And it's because of a lot of things, but they have developed a good reputation within their music industry. And I believe that there is a certain level of working together. Not always. Sweden kind of does its own thing uh, in certain respects, but collectively I believe that the Nordic countries work better than the Baltic countries in this context. Um, the next case, oh, there's some success stories. And Of Monsters and Men are a really in interesting one. 
they were discovered at Iceland Airwaves Music Festival by uh, a scout who at the time worked for Island Records. And Iceland Airwaves is a showcase festival to mainly promote Icelandic acts. It does inter it's bigger now and it does international acts now. Um, you know, and when Saints Go Machine are an amazing Danish success, I believe, mi medium success story, they do very well in Germany. So, and then obviously I go, I, it's the one I know a lot about, um, is Canada. I think that people assume a lot of things about Canada that aren't true. Um, but for a country of 30 million people, we have produced a lot of international superstars, so to speak. Um, some of them have di been directly supported by funding. Some of them haven't. But they've all been supported by the system that was created in Canada over a long period of time to prioritize the, the creation of Canadian music and Canadian business. So in Canada, we do have a quota. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but we also, from our export activities, we measure every single thing that we do. And it's painstaking. And it drives me crazy. And I'm, and I'm overdue on a report right now. But um, we really do. We survey. We quantify everything. And that's a lesson that I always believe is every activity that Music Export Latvia does should have a robust reporting structure and evaluation structure. And it's you guys who should be helping construct it. What do you want out of it? And how can we best analyze that? Because the music industry is really, really hard to analyze. Like you could meet someone now and do business with them in two years. That's really hard to analyze. So it's never, nothing is ever perfect, but we do do every single thing that we can to analyze our activities economically. We don't do a lot of an analysis culturally. We just kind of assume that people like Canada. And, and, um, but we, we do understand that it is important to promote Canada, whatever that means. And we do it through the success in, in our context of our, um, of our artists. And it is amazing that we have such some, you know, like them or not, some very internationally successful acts. And, uh, oh, and, uh, and that's it. Thank so I, I guess in summation, um, thank you very much for having me here. I know that you have an amazing panel after this and, and we're going to have some coffee. Uh, I've been very lucky to kind of do something similar in other countries. Uh, I feel very privileged to be able to go to a place that I never thought I would ever go to when I was growing up in a, in a small town in Canada and talk about how much I love music and how much I want people to hear Latvian music. And I really mean that. It's important for me as well that people hear the great music that, that people are making in Riga and across the country as it's the same in other countries I go to. And I'm really excited to get a big pile of links that I can just go through to hopefully discover the next, the next biggest bands or so on. So um, on that note, thank you again to, to all the people who've financed this the Department of Trade and Industry and uh, Trade and Investment Agency from Latvia, uh, Music Export Latvia, the dude in the suit. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, enjoy your break. Yeah, and, and then stay for the second part.